From 1890 to 1957, IBM provided the industrial age with the timekeeping systems that it needed to grow. Accuracy and reliability were key to expanding businesses around the world. International time recording began as Bundy Manufacturing in Bin Binghamton, New York, and moved to Endicott, New York in 1900 and renamed itself International Time Recording Company. They were the first company to produce time recording equipment around the world needed to provide the controls for the emerging industrial age. Accurate timekeeping systems were important both to the business as well as to the employees around the world. As ITR's business grew around the world, it also expanded its product line to include master clocks that would control the other clocks around the facility. Let's take a look at the first generation of master clocks made by IBM in the early 1920s. The first generation was the largest, with a double crown molding around the top, as well as its panel sides down the left and the right hand side. The wood grain on the backboard is often beautiful, and the pendulum in this case is made of a birch stick with a brass bob. The first generation dial is 13 inches in diameter and features a wood bezel as well as an ITR logo proudly displayed around the second hand. Gen 1 clocks are often labeled with electric synchronized at the bottom of the dial, proudly displaying the fact that it's an electromechanical device. Another beautiful backboard but this time with a double jar liquid mercury pendulum. A lot of pride and craftsmanship went into all of the IBM master clocks. Gen 1 clocks are very rare. But Gen 2 clocks, found in the late 1920s and early 1930s, can still be found. The most visible difference for a Gen 2 case is the simpler crown, a simple single level crown molding. The 60 beat 13 inch dial is most common, but there are also small dials for 80 beat clocks, as well as medium sized dials for 72 beat clocks such as these two featured here on display. An Art Nouveau font, along with the International Time Recording label at the bottom, really are distinctive for the late 20s and early 1930s. The Generation 2 Master Clocks by IBM have the most beautiful wood grains and finishes of all the six decades of master clocks produced by IBM. The styling of the Gen 3 clocks includes a completely redesigned case, much cleaner lines, much less molding, and more efficient use of space. The dial font is clearly a step more towards an Art Deco style. Sometimes the dial would have no mark at all, but most often it was emblazoned with the international logo. The Gen 3s had much more automation control built within them, but there is an absence of weight-driven capabilities in the Gen 3 style. The fourth generation IBM Master Clock is a complete redesign, moving more towards an Art Deco style with square lines and a square dial.
It was a much cleaner look and also included the return of the weight-driven capabilities. A beautiful Art Deco font featured on the dials is carried through the entire line, including the stainless steel versions as well as military versions of the dial. We later saw the IBM logo also featured on the square dial Gen 4. The fourth generation of master clocks were still beautiful in their colors and wood grains. It's also one of the most common IBM master clocks available and because it's newer, it's probably longer lasting. And finally, in the 1950s, IBM offered the Gen 5, which was a complete redesign and was still featured through the sale of the company to Simplex in 1957. The primary piece of technology in any clock is its movement, and we'll begin by taking a closer look at the IBM Master Clock weight-driven movement. The movement sits behind the dial, is mounted on a back plate, and controls the hands that you see in front of the dial. The clock movement is in the middle, and on the right-hand side is a set of gears that are connected to the weights. On the left-hand side is a set of contacts that we'll talk about later. The two weights are typically 13 inches in length and weigh about 11 pounds each. Over time, the two weights drop, powering the clock in its motion. About every 30 hours, the electric motor is switched on, and that begins the rewind process. There's a cluster of planetary gears that give the electric motor the power that it needs to lift the 22 pounds of weight. As the weights approach the top, the electric motor is switched off. And if we watch again with the switch cover off, we'll see that there's a little roller that gets pushed off to the left, breaking the contact and turning off the electric motor. But the majority of the IBM Master Clock sold were spring-driven movements. They were simpler and easier to maintain. The earliest spring-drivens had contacts that were mounted on the post that the escape wheel is on. As it rotates around, it's met by a contact which is connected to the pendulum swing. And when contact is made, it energizes a coil which attracts the winding mechanism once a minute. The second generation of contacts are based on a set of blades which rest atop a rotating cam. Once a minute, the back blade falls first, closing the contact, followed by the front blade falling, which reopens the contact. When the contacts close, it sends power to the coil at the bottom of the movement, which activates the winding mechanism. So once a minute, there's a little wind given to the clock, keeping it going forever. The key to a clock's accuracy is its pendulum. Standard equipment was a brass bob with a brass beat bar underneath as well. This double jar upgrade currently has brass ball bearings in it, but originally it would have had liquid mercury that compensated for temperature changes. The beat bar allowed for calibration of the movement. This 1930s brass bob also features a beat bar with the International Business Machines logo. In the 1940s, a redesigned beat bar and a chrome bob. Or you could upgrade to the new double liquid mercury pendulum, which was much more secure. Finally, on the back of the movements, you can see the verge coming out the back with a single pin on the left for a wood shaft and a double fork on the right for a metal shaft. All clocks needed to show the same time. 
This drawing from 1924 depicts an installation at a hotel where a master clock controls the relays, the time stamps, the secondary clocks, as well as the time recorder. The contacts down the left side of this movement allow an impulse to be generated once a minute or once every hour. And the contact assemblies at the top of both of these movements produce a pulse every two seconds. But the most common is the minute contacts that in addition to winding the clock also advance the secondary clocks throughout the organization. Wall clocks commonly found in classrooms, conference rooms, hallways, and in cafeterias would all be synchronized by the master clock at the central location. Every minute, a pulse from the master clock would advance the secondary clocks. Many times, the wall clocks would be wired back into the master clock, connecting to a pilot dial inside the cabinet. The pilot clock would allow the service person to know exactly what time is being displayed on the secondary clocks throughout the organization. In larger campuses, there might be multiple master clocks that all needed to be synchronized. This synchronizer in the top right is connected to a master master and receives a pulse which holds the escape wheel of this master clock until it is released. The synchronizer allowed for synchronization over a large network of clocks and master clocks. With the frequent occurrence of power outages, this accumulator would keep track of the number of minutes that were not counted when the power was out and restore all the clocks to the appropriate time when power was restored. Program control of attached devices was another characteristic of the master clocks. Businesses wanted to be able to ring bells in conference rooms and cafeterias, as well as sound factory horns to start and end the day at predefined times. The first generation of program machine used a paper tape into which holes were punched at the designated times. When the tape with its punched holes were fed underneath the fingers of the program machine, a contact was made. The program machine gave businesses the flexibility to set and change the times that the horns and the bells would ring, all tied into the accuracy of the master clock and its internal workings. The second generation program machine and the first designed by IBM used a series of plates into which pins were inserted to indicate the on-off times. It was a big step forward in durability and robustness. IBM sold the International Time Recording Division in 1957 and moved more into the computer line of business. But the impact of its time recording and timekeeping roots really left a legacy of the company as well as the industrial age companies that depended so heavily upon it. Check out our other videos on master clocks and other technologies from the early industrial age. And thanks for watching.